Sorry about that. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, for uh, yeah, note takers. So do we have any volunteer to take notes in the Etherpad? We cannot continue until we have a couple of people volunteering. Uh, I mean, there is already some people taking notes. I mean, uh, the chairs will also take notes, but I really need a couple of people to capture the discussions. Uh, hello. <laughs> uh, you, you can just say your name in the in the in either of the chats and say that you want to do the note taking, or just go to the Etherpad and write your name. Thank you, Francesca. So we have one. Maybe someone else can help Francesca. There you go. Take take this. All right. All right. All right. Now we have three people. Very good. Thank you. So let's go to the Etherpad and and when the discussion happens, for those who have maybe uh, haven't done it before, I don't know. Um, just remember that the important part of the discussion, not so much the presentations. Well, the presentations are kind of self-explanatory in a way. And then um, moving on. <clears throat> So the note well here you have some of the rules that the ITF works on. Um, they it's not just about the IPR or about the the um, uh, legal items, but also about the best practices and the best way we can uh, interact with each other. So being nice and polite and and so on. Um, the sessions will run on Wednesday and on Thursday. For today we have. Uh, Maybe the three clusters, the core conf cluster, the group communications, and SNML. And then on Thursday, we will have the spillover of uh, Wednesday, plus the core applications and some discussions that will happen in the on this Friday uh, side applications meeting. Um, and then some flex time for other material. Um, so anybody has some comments on the agenda as it is? I see that Francesca has to leave five to ten minutes uh, early, so we'll try to be on time. Um, are we using? So Alexei is commenting if we are using Etherpad to record participation. Yes, there is, as I mentioned, films. The uh, at the end of the Wednesday notes, you have the blue sheets, so people are writing their names there. Few people haven't done it yet, so please do it. Moving on. Um, so we have a new co-chair. Marco, uh, all of you probably know him already. Uh, he has a PhD on networks and communication security, and and he got a Marie Curie scholarship uh, a few years ago for his postdoc, which is a very prestigious scholarship in Europe. And currently, he's a, a senior researcher in the cybersecurity unit in Rice in Stockholm. And ITF-wise, I guess you have known him for a long time, um, in in both in ACE and in Core, and nowadays especially with group communication in Core as well. So, very warm welcome, Marco. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, all of you, also for the welcome during the past week. I'll just do my best to help this working group and the community. Yeah, and it's kind of strange always to do these things over video conferencing. Uh, I guess ideally we should be face to face, but uh, it couldn't happen. And then also we have, I mean, uh, Karsten raised an email to the main list on on his ten years in core. Which is quite an achievement. Um, again, over video conferencing is is kind of hard to to thank him enough like like this. So hopefully we will have a a warm celebration when we meet again face to face. I don't know if you have something to say, uh, Carsten. By the way, thanks. I mean, we are new, as usual. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it, it's really nice to, to sit here and uh, see everything unfolding. And I can uh, prepare the next working group meeting uh, while while I'm sitting here. So that, that's really great. <laughs> so uh, thank you for, for everything. And uh, I, I made this slide uh, reminding people that uh, we do rotate chairs in the IETF. And uh, I think there, there are very good reasons. People refocus on their jobs. 
um, people change their interests in, in uh, other ways, or people just want to uh, see new people coming in. And while Marco is not exactly new as a participant of the, the working group, uh, he is a, a new chair, and I think that's uh, very important for the IETF to, to have uh, young people come in and uh, 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 perform uh, leadership uh, positions. And so, yes, uh, thank you, Marco, Marco, for taking this on. And uh, I have already uh, seen your work for a month now, and uh, I'm sure the two of you will uh, manage the working group very well. Thanks a lot. Um, speaking of rotation, we also have um, uh, we also have a new area director. Well, new, um, renew in a way. So, uh, Alexi uh, ends his term now, and Barry will be uh, becoming again the core. Uh, with core, sorry, the area director for core, which is great also because he knows the material, and and can help on on that too. Um, I don't know if Alexei, you have some words as well. I think you are in the call as well. Yes, yes, you are. Sorry, did did not expect to, to talk. No, really. but yeah, yeah, I'm very glad that we have new chairs, and it seems like uh, there is more energy in the working group. So that's good to see. And um, I will still be lurking around. So see you around. Hopefully, we'll do more reviews for you. Thank you very much. So um, that ends the intro. Then practicality. So uh, we will have interim meetings to uh, every other week, starting the 29th of April. They will be on specific topics. So, um, for instance, applications is a very hot topic. Uh, the usage of resource directory with ACE in in practice is also a very hot topic. So we are kind of uh, hammering down the details for those meetings, and now is a good time to have proposals. Uh, we haven't sent the invite. We will do that later on. Um, then, uh, yeah, we did a bit of cleaning of the GitHub page, the landing GitHub page. So there you should have now a bit of info on the working group material. So you have all of the slides also on GitHub and all the uh, meeting materials as well as in the data tracker. Uh, we also have the editors page, uh, the issue tracker, and basically all the links together in the same place, which is kind of convenient. I already said this as well. So for the Jabber, just please use the uh, the Jabber bot um, when when we're having discussions. So it's a virtual queue. You just do Q plus to add yourself. If not, you can do Q plus on the WebEx. And uh, if you don't know how it works, just press uh, Help queue. Other people can add you to the queue if you don't have the Jabber. Now on working group items. So uh, we have two new RFCs coming out. Uh, for multipod city and hop limit, which is great. Hop limit was, uh, if you remember, it was also requested by another working group called Dots. Um, so they are using co-op for signaling, and it's great that they can they can use this because they had a, a reference to hop limit. And um, in fact, it might be that we have more work moving forward with them. Uh, then we have on the editor queue, uh, SNMLH and more units, which are pretty much done. Um, there were a few comments on more units that sparked a discussion on uh, cinema versioning, and you will have a glimpse at that uh, later today. Um, in ISG processing, we have resource directory, which by now everybody, I, I assume, has read multiple times, multiple versions. Uh, there were pending comments by Alexei. I think uh, Christian uh, has addressed them or will address them uh, very soon. Either way, they will be discussed on the Thursday session. Maybe we don't need to comment on that. Uh, right now, because we are short on time. And then on stateless, uh, well, they, we have there is some comments by uh, on from uh, Genard and the security directorate, and I believe Klaus is also addressing them. Um, I, don't, I don't think there is also many remarks to be said on this, that they are moving forward. And then on post working group last call. So we have echo request talk, echo request talk, um, which um, Basically, we haven't formally closed, but uh, so basically we need to actually do that. And I believe this version also addressed all of the comments that were uh, raised. So we just need to close that and start with the shepherd write up that uh, to, to send it to Barry. So I don't know. Uh, this one is pretty much uh, done as well. 
and with the URN, there were some comments on the ABNF formatting of the of the URN, and I think the well, I, I know that the authors from their point of view is done, so we just need to formally start the working class call, and we we can continue. So that's so much for the very mature documents, and now we can go into some other items that we have in core. Um, my plan is, by the way, for the author, for the presenters, that I can pass the slides so that we don't need to switch slides. So you just tell me next slide, and and I will do that for you. Okay. So I'll mute myself, and unless there is some comments about the previous uh, drafts, yes, uh, you can go ahead, Alvaro, and present. I assume uh, Ivalo, are you are you presenting or? He's unmuted, but I don't hear him. Indeed, same thing for me. If not, uh, Alexander, maybe. Um, can you do the presentation or chat with? Uh, hi, just 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 a question. Let me see if uh, yeah, I'll, I'll see if Ivalo is having a problem. Okay, we hear you well. Yes. Normally, it's uh, Ivalo that he is making the presentation. Uh, is he still here or he disconnected? Obviously. Just uh, give me a second. I think he's having some technical problems. At the university, we are now using a conferencing system where to join a conference, you have to do an audio test first, every time. <laughs> and I think that that's reflecting experience very well. So uh, I that is true because I, I didn't have to do an audio test. Yeah, it seems to work for me too. Um, we can, I mean, so again, we are uh, well, not, not short on time, but I would like to keep it on time because Seabor is right after this. So, uh, Ivalo, can, can you tell yes, us what's the status? It's best to wait for. Yes, go ahead. So I think he disconnected and uh, yeah, I cannot join him on uh, another channel. So probably he's trying to reconnect. Yes, Maybe we can correct. just wait a uh, minute. A minute to reconnect, and if it doesn't work, uh... can you hear me now? Yes, quietly. Ah, okay. Let me try to improve. So if that. you can turn up your volume a little bit, yeah. that would help. Is it better now? It's a bit. Okay, let me turn it a little bit more. So no, it's... it's good. Please. Okay. Yeah. No, it's good. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for. Just let me know when to when you want to pass the slide. Uh, yes, uh, sure. So uh, uh, I will be. My name is Ivalo Petrov, and I will be presenting the advancement in CoreConf. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as you might know, all the uh, four drafts uh, were in a working group last call. Uh, during that, we had quite good comments from. Uh, both participants in the core working group and uh, from uh, NetMod. So that was very useful for the uh, improvement of the drafts and for having a little bit wider audience that uh, provides some feedback. So there were a number of small editorial changes and things that uh, I believe could very easily uh, be addressed. So for the uh, seed draft that was in version uh, 12, uh, basically I have addressed maybe half of the 
uh, comments already and uh, I plan to be addressing shortly in the remaining uh, comments. Uh, there were a few topics that I believe could be interesting for the working group to uh, discuss in order to have the best uh, possible outcome. So one of the questions is whether we want to uh, be handling in any particular way uh, the possible change of semantics in young files. So what is being uh, discussed in NetMod is uh, that maybe in the future some uh, young files might change the semantic of previous revisions of the same young file. So whether we want in uh, this document to have any particular handling of such situations or we can uh, assume that we can just uh, allocate a new SIT range for those uh, SIT files, uh, for those young files, and uh, have that as the solution. Is there anyone with a particular opinion on this question? If not, um, my intention is to uh, state that we will be uh, relying on additional seat ranges to handle this and that uh, for now we will not add any text for this issue unless there is a, a strong need that is uh, seen by anyone for this. Uh, the other concern was uh, about the early allocation. Uh, some reviewers uh, noted that it's a little bit uh, difficult to understand. And uh, others said that maybe it's not exactly in the uh, spirit of early allocation as in the RFC where early allocation is uh, described it is mentioned that it's for uh, documents that are going to be rfcs and uh, here we are not mandating this we are requiring only uh, expert review uh, state of the document so what uh, i have uh, discussed how it uh, some of the other authors and the uh, document shepherd uh, was that maybe we just need to improve a little bit the wording here and say that it's uh, exactly as early it would work exactly as early allocation but it will be uh, acceptable for uh, expert review uh, points I mean, points that are allocated through expert review. So uh, the intention is to have that rewarded in this way. Uh, are there some concerns about this? Is there anyone that thinks uh, could help with particular text? Uh, otherwise, I will try to write it in the best way I can. So the 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 custom moment the the intention is that um, we are doing the same things we would be doing in the early allocation process, where where the that name is actually reserved to a, uh, for a process that goes uh, through the ISG, and and uh, uh, allows you to allocate uh, code points controlled by the ISG. And we, we, we would essentially have the designated expert ask the same kinds of questions that, that otherwise the ISG would be asking when doing early allocation. Is that, that a correct representation yeah. of where we're heading to? Yes, that is, uh, that's my intention. Yeah, so we probably need a little bit of text because uh, the early allocation RFC, the number of which I forget, um, of course, is, is very much 
uh, oriented towards an ISG based process. And of course, a designated expert doesn't operate exactly in the same way the ISG does. Um, so I think we, we may have to write quite some text there to explain how this is done. Okay. Um, I'm sorry to serve. No, it's also the feedback, I think, from, um, from that uh, an expert review typically is very fast. So you can expect like in maybe two weeks or three weeks, your allocation decision. So you don't need, uh, in fact, an early allocation anymore because you get a quick allocation anyhow. I'm not sure if that's a valid point here, but that, yeah, that's also something to consider. Yeah, is that a bug or a feature? Um, so early allocations have the interesting property that they are reviewed after a year um, and, and they go away if, if nothing happened. Um, so um, by, by mirroring the early allocation process here, we would also be able to issue provisional allocations very quickly and then uh, get them back if, if the thing actually didn't happen which is different from just quickly allocating things where, where essentially the code point is gone. Okay, yeah, I see the intention. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that, that the, the effort is worth it because of the SIDs aren't quite as scarce as, as other code points that we are doing allocation for. Um, so I, I think we have to, to think whether we actually want this, but I, I was just trying to explain what we gain by having an early allocation kind of process. Yes, thank you, Karsten. Uh, so maybe we can continue the discussion on the mailing list uh, in order to have a little bit uh, of time also for the other points, but yes, this is uh, the question that we are trying to resolve and uh, uh, some of the ideas where we uh, we are heading right now. Okay, so uh, one of the reviews uh, stated that uh, for the registries it could be useful to have um, a group of the IAN uh, registries so that uh, they are easier to find. Maybe we should uh, try to uh, find the best name for this group. Um, I can start a, mail, uh, a discussion on the mailing list for this as well. And the remaining uh, issues I would say were more minor and uh, I hope to be able to uh, resolve them easily. Then, okay. yes. Uh, for, for, yes. Uh, before we go into Jan Seaver, then just to note for the discussion that then uh, we will continue the discussion on the mailing list, and uh, that is pretty mature and that uh, there is no major things basically. To... Uh, yes, yes. There were people that uh, stated that they are pretty happy with. Uh, the state of this draft, especially after the reviews are, uh, the comments are resolved. So, yes, enough. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, yes, uh, Jan Pusibor also was in working group last call. Also, a uh, few people stated that it, uh, it is ready for them to be um, moved forward to it. Uh, we I uh, received a few comments and uh, most of them are already uh, resolved. I haven't received uh, formal confirmation from my school, but uh, uh, he will for sure let me know if there are still some things that need to be resolved there. Uh, the question that arose from uh, the answer to the comments was uh, how exactly we want to uh, connect the SITS specification with the uh, Young to Cibor uh, specification. Uh, the question is that uh, well, we could <laughs> mandate uh, that the SITS that we use in the Young to Cibor are exactly the SITS that come from the SID draft. 
currently this is not the case. For now, we are just talking about uh, integers that represent uh, uh, elements, items in the Young uh, file, but we don't say that they need to be provisioned in the same way they are provisioned in the seed draft. Uh, the idea has been that uh, people might decide that they want something else in the future, and it's the uh, comma draft that actually uh, links the things together. Uh, the question is that if we, if someone wants to use the young to see board draft, let's say to do rest conf, uh, then they need to have a separate uh, uh, specification that describes this. Whereas if we had, in a way, recommended the use of uh, seats from the seat specification in the young to see board document, and we uh, declare uh, content formats uh, that could be possible without additional uh, specification. So that's the question: whether we want to uh, whether we want to uh, have that link, that normative reference from the Young to Cibor, or maybe the other way around, from the SIT draft to the Young to Cibor. Uh, in order to uh, have this uh, facility, this piece of use of uh, the just together in other circumstances. Uh, do you want to discuss this now, or maybe we can continue on the mailing list? I don't know. Well, I mean, you have to submit another version of I mean, one way or another, right? Uh, yes. I mean, have, yeah. So I don't know if people have opinion on the on the addition of normative references, but um, I would say probably not a strong opinion right now. It doesn't seem oh. so. <laughs> Maybe you do. Okay. <clears throat> I have a very strong opinion on normative references because uh, I, I was chair of this working group when we had for, we had to wait for a year for uh, RFC 7252 to be published because we had a normative reference that we shouldn't really have had. And uh, uh, then uh, right now I have a document in the RFC editor queue that is sitting there for 140 weeks, uh, which is almost three years now, uh, because we have a what normative reference that we probably shouldn't have had. So um, even even if it looks all very obviously and great at the time you you submit things, it's really worth um, thinking about which normative references you, you want to have um, in a document. And since basically Yang Siba is um, um, a freestanding document, of course, it, it sits on the shoulders of, of Yang, uh, but it, it doesn't really need all the other machinery that, that we are uh, uh, creating. Uh, here, I think it would be best to process this, uh, with the smallest of amount of normative references uh, we can have. And we have to balance that desire with uh, uh, something that Jürgen said, um, which is that it's uh, probably a good idea uh, to make the document also freestanding uh, in the sense that uh, somebody who just wants to use Yang Siba uh, can reference it and doesn't have to reference all the other documents just to get little things like media type uh, uh, definitions and so on and so on. Uh, so th that's essentially the the, the uh, core of the discussion that is going on in the uh, mailing list right now. Um, and uh, I think it would be good if, if uh, people chimed in and, and uh, discussed how to best handle these uh, for documents in such a way that that we minimize the the amount of of g getting things uh, stuck just because they happen to have the wrong kind of the wrong direction of the normative reference arrow. Yes, that's a very nice summary. Thank you, Karsten. Uh, so yes. Well, in in addition to this, by the way, uh, um, did you actually reply to Tom Page? and the feedback he gave on this one, by the way, it was pretty extensive as well. Uh, on this one, I, 
I might have missed that I know he had something on Komai and something on uh, Young Library, so... Uh, sorry for... is Tom... Uh, let me say... Petch. P-E-T-C-H. Yeah, C-H. He's on the mailing list anyways. I, I'm okay. just saying it so that we make sure that in the next iteration, when you submit, the, that all of the comments are addressed so that we don't need to do any more resubmissions. Uh, yeah, sure. I will try to find this email and uh, contact you if I have some issues with that and handle the comments. Thank you for for this point. Okay, so uh, I think we can go to the next slide. Okay, so for the uh, Comi uh, draft, it to us also in working group last call, we had uh, also some people uh, stating that they believe it's all uh, good. Uh, we had a question here, uh, well, we had a few questions. One was, well, what is exactly uh, CoreConf? Why uh, it's the complete cluster, whereas elsewhere it is uh, just the protocol like rest conf it's just the protocol in the same way that we have commi here and not uh, uh, the complete cluster so there was some confusion around uh, this and it came pretty much from anyone that uh, commented uh, on this draft and even some of the other drafts so one maybe simple solution would be at least to include uh, CoreConf in the title uh, or in the, in the abstract at least of uh, this document so that it's much more clear uh, how everything relates together. Uh, if you have some other opinion, do let us know, otherwise we are going to uh, progress in this direction. Uh, and the other part was how we want to actually handle the security considerations. Uh, for sure, one point that uh, could be possible to do is add some uh, references to OSCOR. I think it's missing right now. And uh, possibly to uh, some other things like ACE, but um, I'm not exactly sure whether we want to add references in the security considerations in uh, for ACE documents. My, my concern is whether that might slow this uh, specification down, whether this is something that is really uh, needed or we can just generally state that people need to take care of uh, authorization in one way or another. Uh, maybe it also depends how this will be worded in order to uh, not become a blocking point that uh, keeps this document in the RFC queue for a long time. So, any comments so far? Okay, uh, and uh, next slide, please. So, uh, the last draft uh, from the cluster is a uh, young library. Uh, we still had, it was still in uh, working group plus call. We had uh, some positive reviews and some uh, reviews that uh, ask for some more clarifications. I believe I answered uh, just before the meeting uh, the uh, comments from Tom Page. Uh, uh, for sure he would, uh, he might have others because in uh, his uh, comment, he said that he didn't uh, get in that uh, into the draft. So uh, we might have some more discussions there, but uh, the only other part that I'm aware of is, again, considering the security considerations. 
and uh, I believe if we just link it to the uh, commit draft, that will be a good way forward. Uh, it is, uh, I believe, how it was handled in the uh, Young module library RFC. So my intention is uh, to to do the same here. If anyone has uh, ideas or concerns with this, uh, please let me know. So I assume that there are no comments. Right, yes? So for the, actually, the comment on Tom Page was on this this document. Sorry for the okay. confusion. Yes. Um, so I guess uh, we should, well, you will be doing a resubmission of this one as well. Yes. Um, uh, do you have a timeline for all, because it's few documents, so do you have a timeline for the resubmissions? Uh, so I believe I should have a new, uh, I mean, I will have all the editorial changes uh, in maybe by tomorrow. Uh, towards by the end of the week, and then it depends if uh, some discussions uh, need to be handled in more details. Uh, it might take a little bit more time, for example, for a seat uh, draft, uh, uh, writing down the part about early allocation might take a little bit of time, but in any case, my intention is to try to uh, have a new version by the end of next week. Uh, I don't want to uh, to have very long time before the next version. Very good. So then, in in that case, it would be good if you try to reach out to other potential reviewers that you think could be uh, uh, should be aware of this that you have reached already, um, and and send them that latest version. And okay. other than that, I guess. Uh, we can because we haven't formally closed the working group last call last call on this one so we can just do another one once the new documents are submitted is that okay. a good idea yeah yeah okay. that sounds good to me thanks okay so anybody else uh, we'll be behind schedule so we might be uh, i'm already saying it a uh, warning that we might have to move some documents to thursday next week anybody else has comments on the core conf cluster <laughs> So then let's move on to group communication. Oh, well, the timeline was there, sorry. Okay, very good. Uh, group communication. And uh, Esco, please go ahead. Thank you. So I'll now present the uh, group communication BIS drafts and update for great information protocol group communication. Uh, you can move to the next slide, please. So the goal was to remind you is attempt to be the normative successor of the RFC 7390, which we had uh, it's, uh, experimental for a while. So we want to obsolete that one, include all the content, uh, also update it with the latest insights, and then have a standard track document. And this document can then be used as a standard reference for implementations. And what we have in scope is really a group communication over can be secured using OSCOR or unsecured. And also including the code protocol and any uh, recent developments that might impact group communication. For example, observe, clockwise is there. Security is a clear uh, one. Maybe also the new methods that we have. And as the use cases uh, are now moved to the appendix there. So included as a reference. You can go to the next slide. So the process uh, view of what we did. Uh, we have updated it with reviews, comments. So that's both from Jim and Thomas. Thank you. Meanwhile, it also has been adopted now as core working group document. It's also um, now uploaded and available here on version. And next, I will talk about the, the topics, basically, that, that we made changes on. That's on the next slide. So the content view. Um, what has seen quite a bit of change is the definition section. There's a new section there. 
that defines uh, Asian groups, co-op groups, and security groups, including two new figures. There's also the concept of the group discovery is now added in section 223. And it refers to the resource directory, it can be used for that. There's also an Asia security section that got uh, some comments, it's now rewritten. It's the one countering attacks, mm -hmm. also with more details on okay, what to actually do to counter the attacks. There are many other fixes and clarifications, for example, description of what, what RFCs are obsoleted and updated is now improved. Okay, go to the next. So this uh, figure here shows one example of the group concepts. So if you look in the draft, there will be also the more uh, generic model of this. So the types of groups are uh, shown here. Yeah, the scope group, which is uh, typically consisting of a multicast address and a specific port used by that group. It can be linked to OSCRO core group to provide security. And within that combination, you can also have one or more application groups. So if you think of, for example, indicating an application group on the right path as shown here. So there's a lights one and a lights two. These are two different application groups that drive, for example, different lights, but that reuse multicast group and the port and the security relation. You can also have a one to one to one relation here. But this is now better explained in the, in the graph as well how this yeah how this relation is. Okay. No questions we can move to the next. Yeah, we still have uh, open issues in the draft. So we have uh, a new issues page in uh, GitHub, uh, the core working group repository. There's also still the previous page from GitLab. Yeah, so this number one shown here is from the GitHub uh, issues page. Based on an email thread, uh, there was some discussion about yeah, what is exactly the multicast endpoint concept and can the server actually change uh, the UDP port in response? So that's shown in the figure schematically. So there's a client sending a co op request from a specific UDP port to a destination, and that's multicast. So what the server does here, it receives it at one endpoint and then internally it delegates the request to another endpoint. The one uh, that answers here is at five six eight three. That one responds with co-op response in this case. So uh, yeah, the client uh, doesn't really look at that port number because by the earlier rules in RFC seven two five two, it already knows I should only match on the token value, so not on the endpoint in this case because it's not. Still, uh, there was some discussion on the mailing list because some people thought that it's a bit counterintuitive that the server would actually change the endpoint or delegate internally to another endpoint. So I don't think that's uh, fully concluded yet. Um, that's one of, one of the open issues. And what we want to do is actually clarify uh, yeah, this model. So how all that the port can change. If we all agree to that, then that's okay maybe give some reasons why uh, you want to do that. All right, we can uh, maybe move to the next one. Yeah, these two issues are from the previous um, issue tracker from GitLab. There was a comment yeah, coming from Thomas about using URI host and then application groups. Yeah, that's something we have to also clarify maybe a bit more in the text. So would, would it be advisable to use URI host for that to, to identify an application group or not? There's one issue with the URI host option is that uh, well, you cannot extract that typically from a URI because if you give a regular co-op URI and you parse it into options, then by the default parsing the URI host gets taken out so you get the shortest possible power message and to use that option you have to kind of after the URI parsing you have to somehow put it in again find some some reliable way to, to put it in to indicate the application group but 
that's an issue we, we also uh, are happy to take more comments on that, of course. And the second issue is um, yeah, about response uh, suppression. So we talk about the suppression of responses already. So there is the no response option, for example, in use, or you can configure it on server side. And it's still open question whether that should operate on uh, specific a response a code class or not. So you can uh, basically define it for for response codes individually, for example, whether to suppress or not, but you can also define it for whole class. Um, so that's still an open issue to be discussed. Maybe the authors will also uh, first internally uh, debate about that, see if we can get to a good solution. Okay. Then the next steps is uh, work on these issues, obviously, and Process the latest review comments that came in, uh, yeah, came in after this draft was uh, published, the version three. We also want, uh, on the slightly longer term, to test uh, the selected functions in co-op implementations. One example is the extension of the observe RFC with multicast usage, as described in our draft here. And uh, I heard that first test tests were already done successfully with Californium to, to do that. It seems one of the straightforward things. And of course, yeah, any other things we need to test in implementations, uh, we also need to do that. Okay, so still have some work, uh, work ahead of us. And I think this concludes the presentation. Let me know if there are any questions. Uh Esco, uh, very quickly, just to clarify, uh, you mentioned the issues one on group com Bs and seven and twenty-seven, seven and twenty-seven on the Oscar group com. Uh, the issue thirty-five, where is that one? Yeah, so it was the um, these issues were on uh, also draft group com Bs, but on the non-working group adopted version. I think there's a link also in the presentation which takes you to the issue tracker page where you can see the issues. All right, okay. It's not on OSCOR, on OSCOR group communication, but on the group combis draft. Mm -hmm. and, uh, another comment, uh, you mentioned in your presentation also that uh, you have gotten reviews by uh, Thomas and Jim, right? Um, is that sufficient? Would, would you need more reviewers? Yeah, I think it's always good to have um, more reviewers, of course. I'm not sure at what stage you would like uh, to be useful. Maybe the next uh, next update, for example, we can do, take more re reviewers then. So yeah, always welcome, I would say, yeah, to have more reviews. Uh, we could do a quick call for reviews. I mean, anybody wants to volunteer? You can mention it in the Jabber or in the WebEx. Yeah, it could, could be for uh, the current version or the next. Yeah. Yep. Thomas here uh, for the next version. Thank you. Yeah, so we have three. Uh, well, so in addition to Thomas and Jim, who uh, will review again, um, uh, we have Christian. Um, I see that we don't have, I don't know if people are not using the queue for some reason or if there is no more comments. Uh, if hearing none in particular, let's move to the next topic. Thank you. Let's go. So we start with uh, Oscar Group Com. So Marco, please go ahead. Yes, thanks. Uh, Marco Timoka here. This is an update on the Group Oscar document. Next slide, please. 
Yes, we have just submitted version 8, and it's the second update since uh, the Singapore meeting, actually. Uh, mostly addressing uh, two reviews from Jim, one from Christian. Thanks a lot about that. Some points are still open. I'll mention them in this presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So just a quick highlight of the main updates already incorporated in version 8. Uh, we improved pretty much uh, rules about processing of uh, messages. Uh, both requests and responses, and especially across group recing. So in case the response is protected with a new context different from the one used for the request, the server has to use uh, its own sender sequence number, also included as partial ID. We also detailed the support for uh, observation in line for the different message processing as the OSCORE RFC does. And we have also more security considerations, especially uh, not recommending using uh, the group king material to send a unicast message, which can be the case actually uh, as a need uh, in case the echo option is used or blockwise transfer is used. And we have kind of solved the problem introducing uh, some more content in this document. I'm coming to that. Uh, next slide, please. So in particular, we have defined uh, additional modes of operation of a score. We have always had uh, the signature mode. Uh, if this mode is used for a message, uh, either request or response, the message is signed and it's encrypted with group key material. Um, we have introduced an optimized mode. If it is used for a request, the request is signed. Uh, it's encrypted with group key material, but the MAC is removed uh, to, to save space in the message. Um, a response instead uh, is not signed because it's encrypted with pairwise king material uh, derived locally by the two exact endpoints exchanging a message via unicast. And the pairwise mode instead considers both for request and response, no signature um, encryption and authentication with uh, derived pairwise king material. And uh, when it comes about using pairwise key material, well, you can do that and can be convenient in use cases where you don't have intermediaries, uh, for instance, for verifying signatures like gateways. Uh, next slide, please. And as to the actual uh, pairwise keys, they are derived using um, the same construction uh, adopted in an OSCORE, starting from the sender key of the sender device and uh, a static static uh, the Fieldman shared secret, which is in turn computed out of the um, asymmetric keys of the two exact devices. And this is compatible for uh, ECDSA and EDDSA. We are signaling this so that the message is in particular protected with pairwise key material, uh, setting one of the uh, yet unused bit in the, in the flag byte of the OSCORE option that we are now defining. And, and reserving for this. Uh, next slide, please. So I have now a list of open points we plan to address uh, for the next update. Uh, I'll give an overview. We plan to open issues uh, on GitHub. Um, please comment, especially if you have concerns about the way we propose to address them. So out of the reviews emerged that uh, we should be more clear in uh, what to do with the sender sequence number of a node. Uh, after uh, a group recing occurs. Uh, there are pros and cons with uh, both approaches. We would prefer to uh, not reset the sender sequence number, just uh, keep it growing, at least as default behavior. But of course, application policies on, on a particular node can just override this and, and instead reset it to zero. Uh, there was one point. On the optimized mode in particular, we had concerns from uh, Jim and Christian uh, focused in particular on the optimized request and on the fact that the Mac um, is taken out. Uh, so all considering that instead the pairwise mode uh, seemed to be fairly well accepted, uh, we have this in mind. Uh, we can forget about the uh, optimized mode uh, as, uh, as a mode as such, uh, keep instead the content about the uh, optimized request for, for more thoughts on the raised issues and move the optimized requests as an appendix in the document. Uh, instead, we can move the pairwise mode uh, up to the document body. Next slide, please. 
Okay, of course, we need to say something normative now about what to do with these modes uh, and how to support them. Uh, we want, of course, to have as a must to be supported a signature mode. The pairwise mode can, in general, uh, may to be supported, but uh, we think it must be supported if echo and or uh, blockwise, they're independent, they are supported by a node, because they would make it possible to solve um, security issues you would have otherwise using the group key material. But then practically it's up to the single application and uh, its policies, rules, or exact resource that is trying to access to decide how to exactly protect a particular message with which particular mode. Um, next, we also want to clarify, I didn't mean next slide, sorry, <laughs> next point. Thanks. Uh, we also want to clarify better about the pairwise mode because it's This one, previous one, <laughs> previous slide. Thank you, this one. Uh, we want to clarify a bit better about the nature of the pairwise mode, because yeah, it's a mode of group or score, of course, but if you are willing to pay the price of having essentially a group manager deployed, um, this may be convenient in other setups where um, you're not interested in having messages over multicast, uh, only one-to-one, but this can uh, be helpful for the sake of key management. Uh, in fact, the node can just run on the wire a single establishment with a group manager, and then following local derivation, it can produce the key material needed for one-to-one -one communication with other devices. So we think this is something to clarify when introducing uh, the pairwise mode, but it remains anyway a mode of group of score. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, of course, we, we think of introducing a group policy just to signal the fact that a group uses and supports the, the pairwise mode too. Uh, Christian wondered about the flag bit in particular, if it has any other meaning uh, than signaling this usage, and uh, not that we can think. It was really uh, thought of having group of score in mind. But Christian proposed also to flip uh, the way we use the value of that bit right now. So he's proposing to have it set to zero to indicate, in fact, that the message is protected uh, with pairwise key material. That, that, that's, in a sense, what, what happens in all score to where the bit uh, uh, has value zero, while instead setting the bit to one to signal the message is protected in signature mode. And this, of course, requires um, very doable changes in current implementations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we need to say something, of course, about error handling. Uh, it seems to be able to say something especially about the, the server side. If a server receives a request protected in pairwise mode and the server doesn't support that mode, should just respond with an error, possibly indicating uh, some diagnostic information to help the client. And Jim, in one of his reviews, also raised the possible um, concern in case of observations. Uh, in particular, in case the same client and server are running two same observations, but on different uh, group contexts. Um, this may be a problem that can require the server to do the group identifier in uh, the uh, I think we need to uh, think a bit more about this and if this is really an issue, because uh, the different observations are, are bound to uh, two different token values and they play a role in retrieving the security context also on the client when getting a response. So it may, it may not be an issue, actually, but we need to think more of this. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, final slide on open points. Uh, we have different opinions from uh, Christian and Jim about uh, an appendix section describing one of the approaches for the server to synchronize back with a sequence number of clients based on a, a first trusted request uh, whose sequence number is taken as baseline uh, by the server, essentially. Uh, so Christian proposes to also take and process the request uh, as such, uh, while Jim believes it's actually vital to uh, just take its sequence number as baseline, yes, but then discard that request. So we have different opinions, and this definitely deserves more discussion, starting from the GitHub issue we create. Uh, 
easier things. Uh, we got some text from Christian. Thanks uh, for the appendix related to the pairwise mode, where we describe a very a general, uh, simple discovery mechanisms uh, to the benefit of the client to find out servers in the group and information related to them, to talk to them using the pairwise mode. And this is in particular for their IP address. Uh, we think that text cover pretty well this need, but feedback are, of course, welcome if anything is missing. Uh, we need to add more text now to, to make it possible also for group members that are only silent servers to support the pairwise mode and use it, because, of course, they would also need now to provide a public key to the group manager and possibly have a KID as identifier of that public key. Uh, this will have side effect that we can totally handle also on, on the ACE draft, um, taking care of the key management in ACE. Uh, we will also remove the IANA registers we created here a long ago, because now it seems to be time to point to the new updated COSI registries. And we think of having a new appendix describing a bit more, other than sequence number synchronization, what a device should do um, in case of reboot, essentially. Next slide, please. Yeah, we plan to work on these open points uh, from the previous reviews and the latest review from Jim we got already on version 8. Thanks a lot. Uh, test message protection using the pairwise mode that we are working on uh, implementing. And we think once all this is done, of course, uh, we can consider moving forward to working group plus call. Very good. So we have some comments in the queue. Yes, please go ahead. Um, okay. Number of issues. Um, so let's just start by uh, going back a slide or two. Am I making noise? It's okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat, Jim? You said to go back a couple of slides. Okay, that, that's that's good. No, no, no. The, go, I'll go forward. Just, right. So, regarding baseline synchronization, I said it should be optional to process the first message, not mandatory to drop it. But I believe you should be able to drop it. Okay. Okay. Um, Regarding the pairwise, I'm having problems saying that EDDSA should be the mandatory to implement and pairwise is mandatory to implement because that basically says I need two completely separate implementations of EDDSA on my hardware. Um, one, in, one for Montgomery and one for Edwards. I don't think that's very kind. Right. I'm sure there were some other things that I wanted to talk about, but I'll let Christian go in. Sorry, can you say that again, Jim? Which one? The second one. The second one. Ah. It's say mandatory uh, to implement and. If you, right. If, if you do EDDSA, you have to do both a Montgomery implementation and an Edwards implementation. Because the key agreement and the signature modes use different curves and different math. Christian? Okay. Uh, um on the same topic of the E2 um, appendix, I think that we should be just careful to differentiate here between um, in which situations a client may be at leisure to reply to request when it doesn't know precise freshness and the cases where the client uses, uh, uh, uses the sender's sequence number to return on that sequence number and have different strictness in there because for that, this, is, this is where it gets hard to protect cryptographically, whereas the other thing is just a matter of freshness and do you do you believe that this request is fresh enough for the application to process? Those should be kept apart in those.
Thank you. Uh, maybe Michael and Jim, do you want to, um, the discussion you're having in the Jabber, you maybe want to have it in the call as well for everybody? I know that I understand the question well enough to ask it. <laughs> in terms of, of doing Edward's signatures, there's a draft coming out of Elwig, um, which talks about the EDDSA and if, with the, the mapped signet with the mapped coordinates where you can do both encryption and signing, both the key agreement and the signing. So that could become the mandatory to implement rather than generic EDDSA. That would be great. Maybe can somebody put the link to the draft on the Etherpad for all of us to check out later? Um, I'll find it and do that. So um, Marco is telling me that we are 22 minutes behind. Sure. So if that's okay, unless there is further comments, let's move on. I, I oh, yes. one Sorry. Comment. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Francesca. Um, so um, this is not about the draft, but there has been a discussion in the mailing list about uh, making this document update uh, OSCOR. Um, but because OSCOR right now, if you have been following that discussion, only um, allows HMAC based HKDF to be used for key derivation. And uh, there was some discussion about is this, why was that? And there was no real reason why only HMAC based HKDF are used. So uh, we wanted to fix that and say that all KDF registered in COSI uh, can be used. And uh, John suggested that we would do that um, in this draft, so in this document. and. That would mean that we have a sentence saying all KDF um, uh, uh, specify or register in COSI can be used for OSCOR. And that would mean that this document updates OSCOR. And I agree that we need to do that. We need to uh, make this fix for KDF. But um, I'm not sure that doing it in this document is the best option because. Like, I would like to do it the fastest way possible, obviously, but if you do it in this document, then um, then it's, there's going to be a link where it says that group OSCOR updates OSCOR, and uh, that might give the wrong impression to implementers that they need to implement group OSCOR if they have OSCOR, even though it's definitely not the way it is. I don't know if that was clear. I think so. I think it's um, it's clear. Um, maybe at this point, um, so th this sounds to me like some discussion that needs to take place among the authors uh, of these these details, right? Uh, it's more about if the working group has opinions. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm assuming that I the wanted... opinion... Sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to put that out right now that I agree this change needs to be made, but uh, I'm not sure that we want to make it in this document. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming that the authors of Group Command Oscar uh, will will be the ones having well versed opinions. Uh, to me, it's a bit like Mike, what Michael Richardson was saying that I'm, I don't know enough about cryptography to be able to have an opinion. And I guess for the rest of the group is similar. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the reference, maybe we can move it. Uh, we, we can check it a bit later. We are not. Sure. Uh, it's not urgent. I, I would say at this point. So. Um, my my other thoughts were that for this draft, I guess we were looking for reviewers, right, Marco? Yes, doesn't hurt. <laughs> doesn't hurt as always. Yes. So, uh, if anybody wants to review now, please say so. Uh, you can say it in the Jabber. Let's do plus one, and we will add it to the minutes. While you think about whether you want to review, and write plus one in the Jabber, let's move to the next uh, presentation. I think that would be me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so hello, this is Christian Amzus, and I'd like to give you a short rundown on what has changed on OSCOR discovery. Now, to recap, this is be uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the goal of what we're doing here is to allow um, devices to join a group communication network with a very li limited set of information about the group, 
um, because some of that information might not even be there by the time they are commissioned. So they might not, they might not, they might not know where their group manager is, <coughs> sorry, what IP they'll be running on, etc. So the minimum information they'll um, they'll have is one one of those data pieces, whether it's the uh, whether it's the join uh, the join resource, but more typically it would be the application name of the group. The point where um, we'd like to store that information and make it available to the device is the resource directory because that has the nice advantage of allowing the devices to observe where they can join even before the group manager has arrived on the network. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so we've uh, received a review from, from Jim on the last document. Uh, thanks for that. Um, most of that has been addressed. I'll come back later to what has not, or where we still want to talk about with the group. We've reshuffled a bit of, of text about where, how the registration happens and what we describe about the group manager. We've added a way of um, discovering the authorization server, which means that the device, when it actually comes to join a group, the group can spare another round trip on the network for discovering that information, and there are now examples in Coral. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here, so here is an example of, of what that link looks like. This is the information in there is very similar to what the device would, the joining device would get when it eventually tries to register at the group re, uh, at the group manager's uh, membership resource. Though it would fail in its first attempt because it might not be authorized, and that information can be put right into the resource directory. Discovering it is a bit hard with resource directory as it is using link format, but as we'll later see, can be quite straightforward uh, if Coral is used. Next slide, please. Um, so one thing we've relaxed a lot is is what application, how application groups can relate to, to OSCO groups. That is, um, that could be more than any of in, in one or the other direction. And I think this is something where we still haven't achieved perfect alignment between all the documents that use group terminology. So we might um, we might want to to sit down again and, and um, look into what do we mean by application group, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page here. Uh, if you remember from the last presentation on this, there was a bit of confusion about maybe the last before. Um, about what we mean by the group name, because the concept of a zeroed out uh, group identifier was still in there, that is scanned now and replaced with a term that also aligns with what is used for, for the ACE process of joining later. And yeah, some, some of the other definitions were improved. Next slide, please. Um, if you look at this example here, it shows basically this very similar registration as we had before. So on the right side in the in the RD item, we see all that metadata that is there to inform the client ahead of time about which algorithms and which which key parameters are used in the group so that it doesn't need to fall back to to trial and error. And it also has a, a, a link further on that describes if that uh, resource is accessed, where can you get uh, a token for this from an authorization server? And this is expressed as the ASURI in here, which is not something that is really particular to, to this document, but something that we would probably want to advertise in more general. Um, this is not directly a link you can navigate as you click on there and then you, you're on in a different state in your state machine, but this is a, a metadatum that happens to be expressed in links. So of course the URIs in there all have their usability, but not in terms of hey I'm 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 on this on this thing and I go on to th that thing, but I am on this thing and I see that it has a particular um, AS, and then I can use it in that way. So I think this is aligned with all the all, all of the general ideas of of how Coral can be used. But I'm happy to be corrected there. Um, Next slide, please, unless there are questions about right in here. Yeah. Um, 
we do have one example in there that came across as a bit confusing. Um, it is basically expressing something, uh, a setup that's similar to what is done in Bugnet. This example has a very interesting aspect to it. That is that the um, device doesn't know anything about the group at all, but it only knows the name under which it becomes uh, a member of the network. That is the name under which it registers in the resource directory. Now the information that this device is a member of that is the, is a member of that group can potentially be expressed in a resource directory. It is not with the terminology that is right now in resource directory, but it could be extended that way. Um, in the last iteration of that document, and I think even in the in the current one, um, we use um, sorry. Um, we, we use such a mechanism without being very explicit that this is just an example mechanism that could also be used along here. So there's the open question of whether that's a piece of information that devices may want to extract from an RD in a more general context than in the context of, um, of announcing OSCOR, OSCOR group memberships. But that's basically up to you. So if, if you have more use cases about that, maybe we should pull this out. Otherwise, it might suffice to say that, and by the way, we're using a hypothetical extension to further limit the amount of information that needs to be on the device. Next slide, please. So yeah, um, we've, um, we've asked for reviews already last time. Um, we only got one big one so far. So I think it would help a lot if we could have a few more reviews here and in parallel process the, the open issues that I've mentioned. And I think that's it from my side. Um, yeah, any questions? Uh, maybe I can comment. So on the first uh, example of the, this is a registration, right? Um, no. the benefit of the, oh, no, <clears throat> all right. Yes, okay. yes, this is a registration, but it would, it would look very similar in a lookup as well. The example of the lookup I see is this one, but the, the registration here. So on the payload, you identify the security group that you want to register to, right? On the payload, and the, and on, the, misunderstand. on the payload, the group manager announces a joining resource for a particular uh, OSCOR group. Okay. Along with some metadata of that joining resource, which is the key parameters, and in that case in green, even the authorization server. The, the, the talk, so, but you need the, the AS needs to give you the token before and you register with these uh, extra parameters, like the token. Uh, say again, please, sorry. So, um, on the payload, then you uh, specify the group that you want to register, the, the group that the GM wants to register the endpoint to, and the token that is being used. Right? And, and the authorization true? server that is being used, yes. The authorization server, sorry, yes, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I haven't had the privilege to reading this draft yet. Um, I can volunteer to, to do one uh, pass if, if nobody else does. That would be appreciated. Anybody in the call is uh, interested on the RD and uh, AS usage, um, please do uh, mention now that you want to check it out. Um, Jim, all right, thank you. And, uh, yeah. So, moving on then. Uh, are there any other comments, by the way? Sorry for going so fast on, on these topics. <clears throat> There's a lot of material to cover. Uh, Christian, by the way, you're unmuted. Um, so, um, if anybody has any comments, now is the time. Otherwise, we will move to multicast notifications. All right, let's move on. So, um, still me, multicast notifications. Next slide, please. Uh, the motivation for this is to allow the distribution of, of um, resource updates in a situation where we have 
effective and that usually means cheap uh, multicast. So where there is a lot of subscribers that would usually all observe a single resource and would thus have several resources currently up active at the server. So that putting, putting memory load to the server and at the same time putting uh, load to the putting putting load to the network because responses are sent out individually. So the slide at the bottom right uh, is what Francesca proposed in at ITF 104 as one of the many ways in which uh, PubSub could develop. And this is part of what inspired this document and also aligns, as I think, quite well with what the PubSub does right now. So um, we'll come later to how this could all could all be orchestrated to a pubs to into a pub subsystem to the extent that the actual broker doesn't have to deal with individual clients anymore at all. Um, next slide, please. So co-op by itself doesn't have a concept of a response that go that is going to multicast. So we are introducing this. The most tricky thing about it is that we now have to pick a token. And the concept we're, we've talked already about in at the last ITF is that, um, as always, the client is responsible for managing its uh, the token space. In the case of group notifications, the client is the group as a whole, or the, the, the IP multicast group as a whole. An IP multicast group as a whole needs to pick some representative and that could be the server just as well, which is in this case now picking the tokens that can be dealt out. In a very similar way, <clears throat> the server also needs to pick an external ID or a request ID when it does uh, ask for protection of the, of the responses. So at some point in time, it needs to come up with an original request whose, whose sequence number and sender ID can then be used later in assuring that the responses are all um, linked to, to that request. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, so how we do this, and I'll, I'll start with the second um, large item here, is by introducing phantom requests. That is, we it's, we think of an re a request as it could have been sent by a representative with a source multicast ad with a source address as multicast address. Now that request cannot be serialized over IP, but um, <clears throat> conceptually that request was there at some point in time, and then we distribute that phantom request or the information contained in that phantom request out to the clients, and that can happen. And here I'm coming back to the first point on the slide. Um, this can happen either from the start. So the server knows when it creates a resource that this might potentially be observed, or it can, or the server can decide to switch to create such a to create such a request when it notices that several clients are observing a, res a resource and they might all be collected into a multicast group. <clears throat> The, um, the server uses, so when, when a client tries to subscribe to, a re, uh, tries to observe a resource, <coughs> sorry, it receives, and, and that resource is, be, is available for multicast notifications, and the server doesn't really want to send out individual responses, then the server, in the first place, sends an error response. And that error response tells the client that, sorry, you can't directly observe that resource, but here is some information that would help you achieve the same thing. And that includes a serialization of that phantom request, which includes all the, the request ID data and the client can even decrypt that and make sure that it's, that it, that it's, um, that its signature is correct and so on. And it contains the, the multicast address and can just as well contain a current representation of the resource which is kind of making the response successful, but at least not in the way the client intended it to be originally. So it's still an error response. This also makes things like I'm selecting content format much easier. Next slide, please. 
<clears throat> Since the, the last version of that document that has been presented, uh, we've added a section on con congestion control. This is largely picking, a, picking topics that are already about, but stating that they apply now here as well. We've been, we are now a lot more explicit about how those, inf how those responses are encoded. That is, there is a CBO format that tells where, which details go where on the message. And there's a registry that allows extension of that and gives the, and deals out the short numbers. And next slide, please. And we've also added an appendix that describes how this could be used in a, in a larger scheme of things where it's not necessarily a, a failing observation attempt that is giving the request data to the client. So in the, in the kind of prototypical uh, rollout, the client would request, uh, we would try to start an observation and the server would fail that with the information on how to rather proceed in a multicast setup. But that's not always the case. So um, just, so one, one way of the, for the client to discover that information that is in the error response in, in, in other cases is when it does topic discovery in a PubSub program. This, this topic discovery process usually means that it looks for topics by a particular description and receives a ideally coral document back that gives metadata on that topic. And that metadata could also include all those phantom requests and multicast address data that are necessary in order to get the, to, to understand, to join the multicast group and to understand the responses. Another example where this could, where this information could come from is explicitly asking the server about a token, but that's more for illustri illustrative purposes to show that it could, it could happen in, in a variety of ways and, and there's not necessarily a single, a single way of obtaining that information. Uh, Heimer, you had a question? Oh yeah, I didn't want to interrupt, sorry. <clears throat> Um, um, probably... Well, I mean, I'm yeah. It's just uh, I'm seeing that this um, this draft is in re very related to Thomas's uh, problem draft, <laughs> uh, uh, the the error res description at least, and also related to the pops up draft. And basically, I, I, I was just thinking that uh, if you are aware, well, the pops up, I know you are. I don't know if you are aware of Thomas's draft uh, for the yeah. error response. I'm I'm aware of Thomas's draft. Um, it's not exactly the same topic. So the, uh, the the error response draft is for things that I'd call actual errors in the sense that there is something there there is something really going wrong here. Uh, this is more like this is not really an, an it's wrong. It's more a yeah kind of but not the way you think. Um, it would align quite well, probably, with the with the uh, coral version of pro of the problem of the of co-op problem. Nowadays, it's only coral, <clears throat> I believe. Hmm? Nowadays, we are using only coral for the description. Of the, problem. Um, the the last doc the draft problem, problem document I read was primarily Seabor with the suggestion of it could just as well be be done in coral as well. We have changed. I mean, Thomas can also oh, okay. mention if he wants. But uh, Thomas, the discussion Sorry. is ongoing. But the, effectively, the, the the latest published draft is still the the seaboard, pure seaboard stuff. So that's something that yeah. we should discuss. I think next week. Um, yeah. One of the options we have, you know, very very strong options. We want to we wanted to move uh, um, to a, a, to coralize completely the the draft. Yeah, that was an item for discussion, I think. Uh, so, yeah, we, we haven't. That, that's a good point. This is still on discussion, but yeah. let's say that there is a lot of chances, uh, or, or is looking that we could could go in that direction. Anyways, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so, but but the, my main point is that this sounds like a, an interesting topic for an interim. We already don't have a scheduled one because like the, this uh, uh, common areas between this draft, the pops up. 
uh, mm -hmm. draft and the problem description draft, I think they are touching upon each other a bit. So uh, uh, that, that was my main comment uh, that, that I wanted to say in the queue. Okay, thank you. Um, yes. Um... So we just need to schedule this basically later, yeah. later on. But just yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, so just to, to, to summarize my, my, my point here is that I don't see that there is any particular application error that would be expressed in parallel with that. Um, you could probably, but I don't think that it will be the common case. So in, it, it, th th those can those can coexist. Um, and and yeah, it would be good to have a look at. <laughs> Did I really say plain old Seabor? Um, <clears throat> apologies. Uh, next slide, please. To I didn't say it, but uh, I thought it. Ah, the, the, I'm 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 not to be held responsible for the things that go on in your mind. Um. So, so what? So what else do we have here? Um, one thing that we added as well um, since that dash 04 is how do you cancel all those observations, which is inherently tricky because you don't have a good, I mean, it's, it's a group you're sending to, you don't want to spam the back channel, so you don't have a good grip on the, on the, on the, on who is in that group. And the proposal now is to have a, um, an option in there that gives, that basically communicates this, the service estimation of the group size and asks the clients for feedback so that the server can update its stochastic estimation of the group size. And if that then happens to fall under a certain threshold, it can switch back to individual observations. I think that the most tricky point around here is that the mechanism we are using to get the responses back is that we ask the clients to register for the observation in a unicast way again. Um, there's the recommendation that they do this with no response options, but in a way we're relying on side effects of something that's otherwise a safe operation. Now we are implementing observation. So the, the fact of registering an observation is something that inherently has some side effects, but so in, in, in the essence, um, I think that this is viable, but if there are concerns about doing things that should not be done in a get handler, now would be a good uh, time to raise them. Next slide, please. Um, uh, is that the right one? Yes, I'm just trying to um, to understand Carsten's comment. Um, I think this uh, sampling the receivers probabilistically is just what we are doing, is it not? Yeah, maybe I don't understand what you're doing. Um, so in, in uh, reliable multicast protocols, we, we often have the problem that uh, somebody is sending out stuff and, and really has no idea what the audience mm. uh, thinks about that. A little bit like the many video conferences we're in these days. <laughs> and, um, so the, the idea is to have something like, like a hash value or something that, that um, the uh, sender sends uh, that uh, essentially selects yeah. a small subgroup uh, to send a response, like a re, mm -hmm. re observe or something like so, uh, that. So you essentially need to maintain something like a group size estimate um, at the group head, at, at the side where, where you are sending to the group. Um, and based on that, you can choose the size of that uh, sample. Yeah. So, so that's pretty much what we're doing. The only thing we do differently, and we might take just take your input and, um, and, and use that to make it better, is that we're describing it in terms of um, generating a random event. So we say that if I have one, if I think I have 1000 observers, and I want to get 10 responses, then I send 100 out and everyone tosses a coin between zero and 100. And if that coin toss comes up with a zero, then they respond. And statistically, I get back those 10 responses that allow me to maintain that estimation of 1000. Um, if we make that on properties of the client, then we spare, then we uh, go a bit 
soft, more soft on their random number generators. But that's good. Yeah. So um, next steps here are that we'd like to we'll we'd like to spend some more time um, thinking about the the way we express the phantom request and the possible um, initial response to the phantom request, which we both transport in the in the error message. Um, there are a few proposals around, and if you if you look through the document, you. Um, and the, um, you probably, I think they are. Um, Marco, do you know if you had whether we have them in the very latest version? No, we're still open to discussion according to the okay. slide. Okay. Um, so, but the, the question the, the question is, do we want to have this in a more um, dissected way in Coral versus do we just take the co-op message and put it into a binary field? So this is um, this is one of the open questions, and the other is the topic of the the estimations that we just talked about, where we'll just have to go through everything once again to make very sure that we can't um, make make devices prone to any smurf attacks, where everyone would start sending their responses to a wrong place. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so with that, uh, I think this is only summarizing things that I've already said. Um, questions, comments? Well, uh, thank you, Christian, for the presentation. I, my comments are the same as I mentioned before already, so no, no need to go on that. So if no, the comments are there. Maybe we can move on to the group proxy. And we have about 17 minutes uh, left. Um, uh, so either send email or the uh, new link uh, relation draft will not be presented. I will be moved to the Thursday. But I wonder if Carsten or Ari, if you prefer send email or the, the rel implementation draft to be presented. Which one would you prefer? There's two single drafts there, but. Yep. We could do rel impl today because it's unrelated to SenML and keep the SenML stuff together. That's good. That's that's that was that, those were my thoughts. So let's do then group com proxy now. We shift a bit the the drafts and do the other one later. Very good. So. So Marco. Ah no, Esco. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm here to present this one. This is a new draft uh, for proxy operations for called group communication. To the next. Please. So, the motivation of the dra this draft was actually the um, analysis of group communication that we did for the draft group on this. We described there the use of proxies. It also introduces a number of issues for group communication. In the previous RFC 7390, we more or less said, well, just don't do it, uh, avoid it, because it has some issues. Now we want to uh, kind of make it work, this draft. Um, so the issues are that the clients need to be uh, whitelisted and authenticated on the proxy, preferably, because the proxy will send out a multicast request on behalf of that client. So better to do that. So the client itself needs to be prepared and it may, to, may receive uh, multiple responses to a single unicast request that it's sent to the proxy. Uh, some clients may not be prepared for that. Um, the client may not be able to distinguish responses. So if it comes through the proxy, you cannot distinguish the response anymore based on the IP address that's sent back to the response. So all the responses look yeah, look as if they are coming from a single device, which is the proxy. And also, so far with current definitions, the proxy also doesn't know when to stop handling responses. So when the client, for example, is not inter interested anymore. And yeah, you have to consider. So here there are um, multiple approaches for the proxy to handle the responses. So it could individually forward back to the client as defined by specification. 
Also, uh, we have discussed earlier that it could be forwarded back as a single aggregated response. On, uh, let's say one data structure that contains multiple responses. Okay, now we're going into a bit of more detail. Next slide, please. So what we describe here is a contribution that addresses the issues discussed. And the approach we consider is the individual forwarding back to the client. With the assumption that the proxy can do this, but only if it's explicitly configured to support uh, this method of group communication. And it needs to support also the, the options that we are going to define. So clients are whitelisted on the proxy, uh, can be authenticated by the proxy. And a group of score is also used here optionally as a secure to secure the group communication. Okay, go to the next slide now. Okay, so what this defines is a new signaling protocol with two new call options. And so basically the client indicates to the proxy that is that it is interested to handle multiple responses because it knows that it's a multicast request going to be a multicast request. And also the time or how long the proxy should be active and collect these responses. And we also need the servers to do something. So basically the server uh, that receives the multicast requests has to indicate its IP address in the response. So basically that's the IP address that is transferred all the way back to the client. So the client can optionally contact that server and also identify that server. Okay. Go to the next one. So this is what the proposed uh, option looks like. It's basically a uh, uint encoded in there that uh, plays the time. So for how long the proxy should be active collecting responses. And the presence of the option alone indicates that the client is interested to receive the multiple responses. It signals basically I'm uh, capable of handling these multicast uh, responses that come out of this. Okay, go to the next one. The other option is response forwarding. So this is what the server includes in the response. And it also has uh, some space there to include the IP address where the server can be reached directly or indi indirectly via proxy uh, by, by unicast. So it basically identifies the responding server. Okay, let's go to the next one. So the workflow is uh, kind of. Uh, Say summarized here in uh, some steps. So from client uh, to proxy, we have a client that prepares the requests and selects the option value, and then unicasts the request with the option to the proxy. So we'll skip the details a bit in queue of time. So let's go to the next slide. You see what the proxy does here. So uh, it identifies the client. Also verifies, for example, that it's able to perform this multicast operation with the proxy. The proxy will uh, take the timer value and start the timer, and then multicast the request to a group of service. I have to say here that the time is basically for normal responses. There's also a possible observe notifications. These are an exception. Uh, these also need to be handled beyond uh, the time. So Basically, the observed client state is cleared. So let's go to the next slide again. So we see what the server does. So the server is also signaled, hey, there is a client behind a proxy that, that created this request that you're handling. It does that by detecting the presence of the multicast signaling option. And in the response, the server can uh, also include that response forwarding option in there. Own IP address. Okay, let's go to the next. The proxy then uh, forwards all the responses back to the client individually. It will basically um, ignore late, uh, late responses. 
except again for the observe notifications, which just need to be passed through. And now the client can uh, retrieve the identity of the server from this response forwarding option. And if OSCore security is used, uh, this identity or this, this identifier of the client is also uh, protected here by OSCore security. And after a certain number of time, when the token can be freed again, the client frees, frees up its token. Okay, let's go to the next. Yeah, there's a couple of open points because since we published, we already got a review from Christian. Thanks for that. With many good points to consider. Actually, this led to a proposed alternative design. So that's, you could say, a bit simpler design where the proxy only has to be aware of this multipass signal option. It can remove it from the request. And also the proxy uh, can add the response forwarding options to the responses so that the responses can be identified. In this case, you don't have end-to-end -end security information that is in the options because the proxy will uh, add it and remove it again. So you okay, can arbitrarily change that. Also the end server doesn't know that, that it's a proxy to request. It would also be more difficult if you consider a chain of proxies. But maybe that's not yeah not really relevant perhaps uh, in this multicast case. You have to see that. Uh, another open point was that uh, we thought about authentication of the client to the proxy using OSCore. And in that case, you have a kind of a double usage of OSCore. It's a good question uh, to people, okay, should we define that? Would this be appropriate in this document or maybe in another one? You basically have OSCore from client to proxy and then also from end-to-end -end from client to the servers. A nested usage of OSCore, possibly. Um, yeah, and the final question was um, we have in this document only individual responses coming back from the proxy. So, should we also define maybe the aggregation of responses? Uh, since we have this document anyway, with this scope, we can also add that if we want. So, another open question at this moment. Okay, I think. That's it for the slides. Maybe there's one more. Conclusions, perhaps? Yes. <laughs> so you can check the summary. And the main next step is here to address Christian's comments and also the open points. And again, feedback is, of course, welcome here on this approach and the direction we should take. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um... So, Jim is in the queue. Go ahead, Jim. All these approaches seem to, to assume that there's not going to be any address mapping being done. Is that true? What type of address mapping are you considering? Well, if, if the server provides its, its IP address and it goes through a NAT, that address mapping would not be visible to the client. That's right. In this case, you can, uh, yeah, if, if the proxy doesn't change the address, which is the assumption here, because of the end to end protection, you can only use it basically to um, yeah, identify the different servers. I don't think you can use that address then to directly contact it because. Uh, uh, Mark, here, uh, the alternative approach suggested by Christian on one on the option would essentially solve this, because it would be the proxy um, including the second option in the response based on the server address coming exactly in the response, or the NAT, if there's a NAT. Yeah, that works maybe if the, if the proxy is also the NAT, right? I'm yeah. sure there are other scenarios, perhaps. Yeah, if, if the um, client can reach the proxy, then uh, it can also, through the proxy, perhaps contact these uh, devices, even though the address is changed. In that case, the proxy will uh, know, know basically the address that is uh, 
inside the proxy, the unicast proxy request. So direct contacts might not be uh, feasible. I think if nets are involved, but, uh, through the proxy would be still an option. Go ahead. Uh, the the client needs to discover in some way, anyway, that this particular address will be usable, and that might and in, in the, as part of that discovery process, it might discover that it can go through that proxy. So I think it's it's a bit premature to think about all the, the ways this can interact without having having examples of where the multicast addresses actually come from in scenarios where there is not. Uh, one example that I'd like to provide in this context is <clears throat> when we are talking about uh, co-op over different transports, then this might be the only way to multicast. So for example, if you're having a device that is run, if, you, if your client is running in a web browser and is keeping the web browser through a co-op or a WebSockets tunnel, um, then it might ask the proxy to just look around what is there. And it, then it would send a, a basically the uh, all co-op, all link local co-op devices a broadcast address to that proxy. And that address would not even make sense to itself, to, to the client itself, but the proxy could send out a request and the responses that come back their addresses make sense in the context of that proxy. Yeah, it could be the even link local addresses basically, and if we use the same proxy again, then that can be used uh, then, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, guys, um, I see the queue is empty, and actually there won't be any time for the further presentation, so we will move them to the next Thursday. And let's put a pin on things, because the CWAR session is starting right now. Two minutes. So thank you very much for your time and and hope to see you next Thursday at the same time. And we will talk about core uh, applications and about uh, a bit about CNML and a bit about uh, link relations. Thank you. It's a different time, I think, right? Next week? I think, uh, wasn't it? Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Good point. Uh, no, no, I think it's the same. The same it starts the same. at the same time. Oops, sorry. Just, uh, it's shorter, one hour and a half. Oh, yeah, it's shorter one. Yeah, okay. Thanks. At the same time. All right, so see you. Thank you all. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye. bye. Uh, Marco, can you stay a bit longer for the practicalities? Thank you. Of course. It's interesting to see the people disconnect now. Pew, 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 pew. Okay, so maybe uh, you may want to turn off the recording first. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you, Klaus. Bye. Bye. So.